So for me, when I decide to close a trade or buy at a, at a specific point, I am fully unemotional and I know that I'm making the best decision at that point in time. And going forward, I just have to, you know, trust that I made that decision with the best intention and deal with it going forward. Hey guys, we're in for a very special treat today because we are interviewing one of the most popular investors in Oxford, in Europe, and she's going to share her techniques. She's going to share also uh, her strategies, why she entered the market. We have Heloise Grief in the podcast joining us today. So, Heloise, how are you? How's everything in Oxford? Hi, Marvin. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really great, uh, grateful to join the show today. Oxford is just opening up from the lockdown, so things are slowly starting to go back as normal as it can be. But given me a lot of time at the desk to do loads of research and keep my eye on the stocks over the last few months. And this is what I like about the stock market, because if you study a lot of people who have been successful from Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett, uh, Peter Lynch, they all have different techniques and I'm excited for what they can learn from you because my goal here is that uh, as they hear your principles that there will be a group of people that will attach themselves to the way you do, it, do things and hopefully will help them also in their trades. So before we go to the specifics of trading and investing, can you tell us more about your background, how you started, where you came from, what brought you into the exciting world of the stock market. I grew up in South Africa where I did my undergraduate degree in mechatronics engineering. So I was obsessed with robotics mm. um, and finally came to the UK to do postgraduate studies in clinical machine learning. So I now live in the world of analyzing data, essentially. Um, and while I was doing my MBA a few years ago, I have always been interested in the stock market, but because my background was not in finance, I didn't have the confidence or know how to, to get into trading. Um, and while I was doing my MBA, I was surrounded by people who were just trading, um, you know, in their free time. And so um, it was only afterwards that I finally got the courage to start researching on the internet, um, how I could get into the stock market myself. And of course, that's when I came across eToro. This was back in 2015, 16. Uh, eToro was not as well known as it is now. So I was a bit skeptical what I was getting into. Um, but I knew that there was only one way to learn and that was to put a little bit of my own money into into it and I call it school fees uh, and that's essentially how I, I started learning trading. When you said you, you wanted to put a small amount of money first, uh, how, how did you decide? Because that's one of the biggest uh, questions that people normally would ask. When I invest, uh, how much is a good amount to start? How did you navigate that when you were starting out? That was for me really trial and error and figuring out the kind of hard way what works. I put a few hundred dollars. At the time, the minimum eToro trade was $50. So mm. a few hundred dollars allowed me kind of have a few stocks in my portfolio, but definitely not um, enough to have it diverse enough. And so over time, I just kept adding as and when I could. It's quite a tricky question. It's a balance of how much can you afford to put in a kind of high risk investment, especially if it's something you're learning yourself. It's even more high risk than normally going into the stock market and so for me it was really just I was almost ready to lose all that money because mm -hmm. I as I said I pulled it school fees and for me I just wanted to learn the experience and mm -hmm. uh, fortunately it, it turned out well. I like what you said it's school fees that you weren't there first to make money you were there first to learn then as you started to learn that's when the I guess the earnings started to come in. Uh, Follow-up question to that when did you realize that hey I'm earning already. This is something that's working. I should actually add more money. I would say six months mm. uh, to start earning. And you can see that from my eToro portfolio. Of course, that's one of the things about eToro is that our, um, our histories and our performance is quite public. Mm. Um, so it took me about six months and a lot of different strategies to finally settle on something which was working for me, which was a comfortable strategy for the amount of money I had 
put in my portfolio at the time as well as the amount of time I could commit to trading at the time. So yeah, I would say about six months. But did you put a deadline there that after after six months, if this does not work, I'm going to stop trading already? Or you were decided that no matter what happens, I'm going to pursue stock trading? No, I kind of thought I'll just trade until the money is finished. And <laughs> then um, it kind of dipped and at some point it started growing. And I was like, mm. well, I guess now, yeah, now I'm here to stay because instead of uh, going to zero, the balance started increasing. We've seen the U.S. markets uh, this year after the drop in March started to go up. And as it starts to go up, the biggest temptation for a lot of people who are starting is I'll put in more because they think everything will will go. Did you ever have that problem or you were emotional already that I'll put in more at the, at the highest point? I think it happened to me right in the beginning. So when I first started, the thing I was drawn to first was commodities. I was, um, I was actually day trading oil. You know, I was eager and I was hungry to learn and I didn't have the patience to wait for months. Like now I, I keep my trades for months. So mm. it's a lot slower game. But when I just got into it, I was quite eager and I wanted things to change immediately. And of course, then you go to oil, which at the time in 2016 was um, fluctuating by the day. You're currently employed now and you're also uh, trading the markets at this at the same time. And as much as I would love for everyone to have investment in the stock market, what's your advice for people that want exposure to the markets but are also busy with their job? How do they know that they could trade it on their own? Or how would they know that it's better to just copy someone else? I think it really comes down to interest and how much time you want to dedicate to it. If you don't have an interest to you know, check the stock prices often, but you want to have a bit more exposure to go to someone to copy someone direct rather than going through a, a broker or anything like that it probably makes sense but i always say if you really want to do something you will make time for it no matter how busy you are if you traded some of the stocks you know there's this old saying that you can buy a stock and go to sleep and you know when you wake up it should have grown you could probably get away with not having to check it every day the stock market price but if you follow the news and generally the trends which we all tend to do anyway um, you could probably manage your own portfolio people always think that uh, it's you put your money there it will grow but what I always tell people is the stock market or investing or trading in general it's not just passive income it's something that it's a skill that you need to grow it's a skill that's something you have to enhance. What were the things that you needed to learn from your research and your studying to help you become uh, profitable? I was looking at your profile that you said, I don't do fundamentals, I do pure technicals. This is all technical analysis. How does it go for you? Biggest lesson I had to learn was to be patient and mm. to be disciplined and to stick to the strategy I had no matter, because I think the biggest mistake you can make as a new trader is to become too greedy, you know? Like mm. you'll always think, oh, it's gonna go up and I'll just wait a bit longer or, oh, it's gonna go down. I'll just wait a bit longer but if you have a strategy and you're disciplined enough to stick to that that was for me really when things started to turn mm. um, when I when I managed to stick to that uh, and then the second thing I would say is to really stick to what your you know what your skills are for me I have a PhD in machine learning and my bread and butter is really to analyze data and that's why I take a more a stronger approach on like technical analysis because I feel comfortable as we say eyeballing the data and making a decision based on my perception of data because that's what I do for a living um, and if somebody else has another strength then that should be their angle that they focus on. Are you more of a person who plots support and resistance and then every time it hits a support, you buy there then wait for the next resistance? Or are you a trend follower waiting for reversals uh, before you start to come in? I would say a bit of both. Sometimes I wait for resistance if I think that that particular stock will hit a resistance and sometimes I just average the market. So I would buy a little bit of stocks like over a week or a month so that I kind of you know, diversify a bit more, mm. so. Because everything is online. It's so easy to buy, it's easy to press. When it's time to exit, especially that 
they're exiting at a loss, that's where people have a hard time. What yeah. do you do? Do you have any rules that you can share to people that, that could help them out, especially when it's their money and then they'll have to bite the pill and lose? My portfolio is typically a long-term portfolio. So I think allow it to dip a bit more uh, lower because I would wait for the dips uh, for it eventually to turn up again. So I do tend to tolerate a bit more downward trends um, mm. than usual. But because I have a responsibility towards my copiers uh, to keep a certain risk score, uh, as we call it on eToro, um, at some point I do need to cut my losses and I do need to decide that, you know, this is this is getting too risky for my portfolio and I need to keep in mind that I have my copiers. Mm. So. Um, yeah, if I think that the stock is likely to recover based on either the market trends or my own analysis or my own intuition, uh, I will hold on to it. You, you can see from my portfolio right now that not everything is in the green. There is a lot mm. of things which is in the negative at the minute. Mm. Um, not very, I, yeah, I don't tend to kind of tolerate very low turn downs. When we were talking about it being in the red, so what's your philosophy behind it? Uh, you mentioned you were willing to wait as it was it's down would you add more into it knowing that it would give you a larger upside or uh, since it's in the red you're just you're not gonna add but you're just gonna hold because you know it's gonna recover back so i used to not add more when it was in the red because i was too scared i now follow a more balanced approach where if i truly believe that the stock is gonna go back up i will add more to mm. benefit from the risk that I'm enduring by being in the red. So yeah, I will add more if I think that it's going to turn back up. You said that when you think the risk is too much, you're already going to let go, you're going to sell a red. When you say that your trigger to sell is the percentage might be bigger already or because you've been waiting for a longer period of time and it's not really moving up. Uh, do you sell based on uh, the possibility that it will go down or the length of time that it really is not going up yet? As I said, I've learned to be a lot more patient than I used to when I just started. So if I truly believe that it will go down and also depending what percentage of my portfolio is in the red, I might be willing to carry it for a bit longer. If there's a very high probability that it's going to go down, then I'll probably won't have that much tolerance for it. I'm currently looking at your uh, portfolio right now and there's I think over 20 stocks right here. I'm just curious what's the logic behind uh, distributing it with that number and then second are you intentional that I'll put this much weight on Bitcoin I'll put this much weight on Unilever I'll put this much weight on or on Square or is it more because oh this is a buy signal for me I'll buy this so something like that my strategy as I describe on my portfolio is that I'm a more low risk kind of um, moderate return uh, portfolio and that means that during an uncertain time like the pandemic we're currently in I need to do what I have to to continue to stay in the market and kind of try and capitalize on the potential gains that there's been but at the same time try and minimize the risk to my copiers and that's one of the reasons I've diversified so much currently okay. um, it is a bit of a stretch, I have to admit, because every stock you add, you do have to, you know, monitor them and do your re research on them. So I think I've started to scale it down a bit uh, in the last few weeks. Your largest positions are Mastercard, Microsoft, but there's there's no position more than uh, I think around five around five percent. Is that? Uh, is that intentional that you won't put more than 5% for a specific stock? Before the pandemic, I definitely had more than 5% in single stock. But because of how diverse my portfolio is right <laughs> now, I think I have that is about the maximum I, I'm currently putting into one stock. Yeah. When the drop in March happened, when you were experiencing it, how was it? How was it on the way you were thinking? and the way you were protecting your cash as well. I actually had a um, interview on prime time on Money FM. I think it was in the beginning of March. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it was officially a pandemic at the time yet, but it was at different stages in different countries. And I got asked the same question back then. Of course, the answer was a bit more lightweight back then because of the seriousness of the situation at the time. But I was quite fortunate in that I was quite conservative already in December 
December because of the where I thought the market was in December. So I had already started to liquidate a lot of um, of my portfolio to prepare for what I then thought was going to be a natural downturn in the market. I I mean I'm not a fortune teller. I did, definitely didn't foresee <laughs> the pandemic. Because of that strategy, I was. A, I had already pulled out of the market um, quite a bit at the time. When the market was hitting all-time highs last January, did you ever feel bad that you sold too early? Or you know that it's part of my plan, I'll stick to it even if uh, the market's hitting all-time high, I'm not gonna chase it anymore. Got a lot of questions from my copiers because when you know when the market is at an all-time high and you're not fully um, invested, <laughs> people question you about it, rightly so. But I think, yeah, it was part of my strategy. And as I said, one of my biggest strengths has been being disciplined to that strategy. And in this case, it turned out. And I don't believe you can time the market. I, I don't think I know anyone who does. So yeah, that was just part of my strategy strategy it means that i missed out on some of the highs but i think in retrospect my copiers are really grateful that we also missed out on the, the very big <laughs> that followed amazing but do you do you ever get emotional still whenever you see large drops large moves or you're very unemotional when it comes to the markets already and i guess uh, tips for people who get emotional uh, when they see large volatilities that was one of the things i learned early on was not to be greedy because it's really our greed and that to maximize our profits uh, that kind of makes us regret decisions we take or didn't take uh, um, in the past and so for me when i decide to close a trade or buy at a, at a specific point i am fully unemotional and i know that i'm making the best decision at that point in time and going forward i just have to you know, trust that I made that decision with the best intention and deal with it going forward. You have a diverse set of stocks here. It's not just that it's well diversified. Uh, they're from different industries, but yeah, I see you have a lot of tech stock. What's your logic on filtering it out? Because there are thousands of stocks. Then you also have cryptos. Since there's a lot, what do you do? Is there a filtering system that, uh, that you use for you to be able to select or you just make a watch list and then you dis disregard everything else. Because I have a full-time job, I have to be a little bit strategic about the stocks that um, invest in. So healthcare and tech is my biggest focus because that's what I do a lot of my research on um, during the day. So that's already kind of narrows, narrows it down for me a lot because that's what I'm comfortable with. I know those industries and I believe that I understand the trends uh, in those sectors. Again, as you point out, my um, portfolio is a lot more diverse than it is than it used to be, and that's partly just because I've tried to include a bit, a slightly a bit of European stocks mm. because of what's happening in the US, and then also some other sectors. Again, just to diversify. And I, I think the larger your portfolio is, the more you diversify already. It's easy to say don't diversify when your portfolio is small, but the larger it is, a responsible way to also manage money. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I've definitely had to stop myself. Like you're saying, the bigger it gets, it can become quite uncontrollable quite quickly because it's more and more easy to add just one more stock, one more stock, but every stock you add is an investment of your time and efforts to kind of track and monitor that stock as well. So do you watch all of this every day? I do. <laughs> <laughs> like all of them every day as soon as they open and just before the market closes. I don't necessarily do a lot of analysis or in-depth reviews on each of them every day, but I do kind of. And that's again coming back to what I said my strength is. I look at data all day every day and we have a technique called eyeballing data and that's really like you know just by looking at the data you do kind of get a kind of intuition of which ones you should filter out and which ones you should keep a closer eye on so that's one of my skills i have which i'm using it, uh, with my trading as well anything that you want to impart to people or share on uh, what's the easiest indicator for you to 
uh, use or learn? So I use some of, you know, machine learning techniques to analyze the data. Moving averages being one of them. I like, mm. that's one of my favorites as well. But Fibonacci or some of the more technical um, finance tools, I don't necessarily use them. So everything is based on machine learning, not, not, much, of, not much of the technical tools? Um, a lot of machine learning, I would say. It's how I feel comfortable to analyze data. So that's what I rely on. And that's probably what I would tell other people to do is to use something which they feel mm. comfortable with, which they understand and mm. which they trust to mm. use as a tool. So in your decisions also, does it not play a part in your decision making as long as they're tech and as long as they're healthcare? Uh, you're okay with it already? You don't look at their cheap or expensive or their cash, their level of debt? I wouldn't say that I exclusively use one or the other or that I disregard fundamentals because um, if you do purely technical analysis, you disregard the whole uncertainty of the stock market, which includes, you know, the human behavior. I would say they're in the back of my head, but they're not necessarily in the front of my decision-making process. Mm. For copy trading for people who want to copy you there's always an option there to copy your current positions or to just copy the ones that you will buy afterwards what do you suggest for people who want to copy you to copy the open ones or just to copy the new ones i encourage people to copy my open trades uh, and that's partly because i do tend to hold them slightly longer but i also encourage people to only copy me if they're able to do it for a slightly longer period of time simply because of the nature of my trading strategy. So I think copying open trades give them the maximum benefit of, of copying me. Okay. And and you mentioned that it's for longer horizons. You you noted that it's for five years. Any rational behind the five year time frame for for investing? And especially now what I've noticed are people who are starting now, uh, the common tendency of newbie investors is they want to get rich quick. They want to do it now. They want it to happen at this very instant. Seeing a lot of, if you've watched the news about people making money from Robin Hood, how they bought airline stock, how they bought airline stocks, and for people when they try to see that, oh, it's that easy. I could get rich quickly. What's the rationale about five years of investing or at least five year time frame? It's not my rationale. It's kind of the known um, sentiment that the stock market is a bit more a longer term investment. So the reason I do um, communicate that on my Toro portfolio is because one of our responsibility as a popular investor is to kind of help our copiers make an informed decision. And as you're rightly saying, a lot of newbies uh, or people who are just kind of getting into trading see it as a get quick rich scheme which it mm. really isn't and that was a very frustrating thing for me when I first became a popular investor is that I would get people who copy me only for a few days and then get frustrated because their portfolios is still not showing any profit and that's just not the nature of how I trade or how I believe you can make money on the stock market so five year yes it's a bit of an arbitrary value I'm not promising anyone to make a big profit after five years if they copy me but it's a kind of way where I'm trying to um, tell people to be patient to be um, to yeah kind of set their expectations as to what they can uh, anticipate if they do copy my portfolio. You've traded Microsoft, Amazon, and MasterCard frequently. What's your most memorable trade? And is that also your, the best trade that you made? Because a lot of people would want to know, what's her favorite trade? What's, what's the best that she earned when she started to invest in the markets? I don't think I have a favorite trade. I don't leave my trades to kind of maximize my profit. So once, once it hits a certain percentage I tend to close the trade and immediately reinvest so I don't typically make massive massive profits on a single trade just because that's not my strategy but I have as you're saying Microsoft and MasterCard has probably been my favorites over the last few years just because I feel that I understand the underlying technology and I could kind of understand the trends in the market for those ones. Most memorable loss? Definitely oil when I just started out. I, I nearly didn't make it past my cutoff of wiping out my entire portfolio. Oh. So staying away from that one. 
Did, did you remember how big was it uh, percentage wise? When you I think the stop loss was was set at fifty percent. So Whoa. thankfully it wasn't that, but it hurt. <laughs> I forgot to ask this. Do you do you leverage? So as a popular investor, we're not allowed to take the maximum allowed leverage. Um, but I don't leverage um, as part of my portfolio now. Just curious, if you were not a popular investor, you were just trading. Uh, trading your own also uh, your own money would you still leverage or not as a principle don't like the risk attached to leverage as well yeah so I don't like the risk I was on Toro for three years before I became a popular investor and I've not changed anything of my strategy I still um, see it as my own money and my own responsibility and I uh, treat other people's money in the same way you're very popular worldwide what's your edge I'm asking this also so that it's time that a lot of people who really don't have time to invest, that they just invest in other people who are good. I think it must be that I'm really doing it out of interest and passion. I mean, I'm really not doing it for the money. Of course, as popular investors, we do get compensated by Toro. I was trading for three years before I got picked up by their algorithm and they reached out to me. And yeah, just continuing with being disciplined and sticking to my strategy and being unemotional is probably my edge. You said that uh, while you're working also, uh, you watch all of the stocks in your list. How, how long does it take for you to, to study that? every day um because i'm in the uk and a lot of my portfolio is in the u.s yes. i'm kind of fortunate with the time difference so when the u.s stock markets open it's around 2 30 p.m in the uk so that's usually when i take my lunch break um mm -hmm. and during lunch i probably spend an hour kind of seeing what the market is doing as it's opening up and what kind of trends are, are coming up uh, and then again you know once i get off work in the evening i'll have another quick look Look as I'm heading home, uh, and then I'll I'll be online for another hour before the market closes. So um, and then anything else, reading news or researching, reading company reports, that's on top of of that time. So if you guys want to skip all of that, uh, all of the time that she's spending on researching, uh, might as well just copy. Eloise, uh, in, all, in all of this. Before I let you go, I have two questions. And because of this pandemic, this is something that a lot of people did not predict. No one forecasted this. That it, it's going to drag even uh, this long. For those people who lost money, not just probably in investments, but also in their businesses, uh, if it was you and you would lose everything, as in zero, you'd be wiped out, what would you do? And the reason why I'm asking this is, so that other people might see, oh, she's doing that. I, I might try to do that as well. The same as my portfolio, it probably comes back to my philosophy in life is just to be diverse. Um, my partner and I lost our Airbnb business as part oh. of um, as part of the pandemic. But you know, we already have two or three other things that we're working on. Um, so we're always busy with a lot of different things, um, just because that's how we diversify our risk and that's how we kind of always try and land on our feet so if you look back at the history of humanity as like you know heart-wrenching as it is that what people are going through during this time we always seem to kind of recover from these times and you know in these times there's always a lot of opportunities mm. so it's just to go out and look for those different opportunities they might be presenting themselves in a totally different way because of how life has changed um, since the pandemic started so that's why the rich get richer because in times of crisis, uh, they always see it also as an opportunity. It's all about how you perceive things, what your mindset is that things may be bad, but the ones that really make it out is in the midst of how bad things are. They're trying yeah. to find ways on how to come out on top. That's definitely true. And that's one of the things I carry from growing up in South Africa, growing up in a developing country. Country, you know people are so innovative about how they adapt to situations and that's just something we can again apply during this time so definitely that would be my main piece of advice to people how about lastly for those who are scared anxious 
Uh, any any words of advice for them? A lot of great things which I have missed have come back. People are, you know, looking out for their neighbors and we're really getting in touch with family members we may not have been in contact with. And really, you know, reconnecting with that human element has, has I think, been a great um, a realization for a lot of people to realize that one we're not alone during this time we can call on friends family neighbors to to help us out and again as i said earlier like if we look back at history yeah we've always been able to to recover no matter how difficult times have been so we should look at the future with with a lot of opportunities ahead for those who want to copy you, can you give them the steps on how they can find you, how can they copy you, and how can they make money off of you? <laughs> yes, I'm always uh, happy to have new copiers. If you are already on eToro, you can look for me under the popular investor list. I'm happy. Of course, if you want to reach out to me directly, find me as Marvin did on Twitter. I'm at Heloise Grief. Hopefully, Marvin can type this out. So yeah, either one of those ways. Write to me directly on Twitter. I'm happy to help you get your eToro account set up. Or if you're already on Twitter on eToro, um, you can find me at RubyMZA. Guys, I'll put the link below on eToro, and then I'll also put her account. I'm, I'm, I'm so curious, why that name in eToro, by the way? Oh, it's like, it keeps coming up. When I met the guys from eToro the first time, I, because I was learning on eToro, I really picked a pseudo name. You know how everyone has a gamer name that mm. to totally hide their true identity? I picked a name which I didn't want anyone to know I was trading because remember, I was still, like learning this trading thing in secret. Mm. So yeah, I've asked them to change it. Unfortunately, they can't. So I'm, I'm stuck with it now. It's my <laughs> online hidden name, which is now very public. So <laughs> What's so interesting was when I was talking to people, we weren't actually sure if your Twitter account was your. I was. Is this really hers? Is this a. Is this a fake account? So uh, I'm glad it that it's not. It's not. <laughs> it was intended to be a fake account, and I've asked the Toro to change it, but there's. Yeah, I'm stuck with it now. I also play online games, and my account for one of the games that I play is Warren Buffett. So it's not so secret. It's not so secret. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, I guess you kind of do that. Although I think mine sounds a bit like a stripper name, but oh well, I'm stuck with it now. So. so I guess that's it. Thank you so much, Heloise, for taking the time uh, to to share your insights and principles. And I hope you got, guys got a lot from this. So the reason why we're doing this also, as you, as you look at it, her style is different from my style. Her style is also different from a lot of people, but she's successful at what she does. So that's, I think, one of the best things about investing in the market is it's not a one-size-fit-all strategy. That's why even if you look at the popular investors, there's so many popular investors and they have contradicting styles because it's about finding what will work for you. So... That's it for now, guys. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section and then we'll try to make more videos on top of that. But if you want more of Heloise, put it also, I want Heloise and then we'll see if we can get her back again here. So that's it for now. I hope this video helps, helps you trade well, trade strong, trade smart. See you all again soon and God bless you all.